So this lecture is on ecological techniques. And I moved my clicker to the, uh, to the office. So you're going to have to excuse the reach here. There we go. Objectives are to list and define several ecological te techniques, such as transect, quadrat, and mark recapture. And of course, define a study state kind of by the question that you are asking. To find sample size and compare it to population. And if that doesn't get fully covered in this, don't worry, there will be many other lectures where we do that. And last, to differentiate between a hypothesis and a prediction. <clears throat> All right, this is field ecology. Let's talk about field studies. So here's a theory that there is niche partitioning between different types of birds. What's the background? It's believed that two species with identical, identical requirements cannot coexist in the same place at the same time. Basically, one will outcompete the other, or one's population will grow faster than the other, and you know. So the niche partitioning theory would state that the bigger a tree, the more species of birds that live in it, the more they're going to each have their own kind of area. So the prediction really is that there's a bit of partitioning. So they're going to find different birds in different areas if different birds live in the same tree. So they, um, the study here, their site, their study site was a tree. And okay, it was several trees. Each one of those is a sample. So they divide the tree into different zones. So the upper, out, upper outer, so like the top of the tree with the outermost branches, the upper inner, it's the top of the tree, but there's branches at least half a meter within, uh, the lower outer, lower inner, etc. And they looked at these five different species of warbler and looked at where they did the most foraging. So it's kind of an absence or presence studies. Is the black, if the blackbirdian warbler is here, you're going to see it existing in a different spot, doing its foraging in a different spot than the Cape May warbler will. So their study site is defined by their question. And their prediction is really an if-then statement. If there are multiple species of birds in a tree, then they will be using different resources. So that's the uh, birds study. Speaking of birds and bees, bees study. Bee for bees. So a couple walks into Applebee's. The girl says, I'll have the apple. And the guy says, I guess I'll have the bees. No, that's not the bees study. The bees study here is asking the question, how much do energy do bumblebees need to, uh, to exist, to fly around? So it's really a question on foraging. And that's going to require quantitative measurements. So first off, how much energy does a bee get from visiting a flower and sipping nectar. Well, they're going to have to um, get the nectar out of a flower, put it in a calorimeter, calorimeter, and see how much energy they can burn off. And that'll tell you how much energy each bee gets from each flower visit. Okay, how many flowers does a bee visit? Okay, so they're going to have to watch a bee. So, you know, this is when you're going to stare at a, an insect flying around, see how many flowers it visits per minute and all that. See, does it, does it visit more flowers when it's colder out? Does it visit more flowers when it's warmer out? Because these are endo ectothermic individuals, so they're getting energy from the warmth outside. So there's a real lot of small measurements for that, but this doesn't actually tell you how much energy the bee is actually expending, just how much it's getting. So for that, you capture a bee, and um, I've actually done this a bunch of times for measuring various things on bumblebees, and I can tell you that when you do capture bees, if you put them in your hand, then you can actually understand the concept of uh, which flowers are the best looking better. I mean, beauty is in the eye of the bee holder. Okay, enough dumb jokes. Back to the points. The Bee would be put in a metabolic chamber, oxygen would be fed into that, and you'd measure the temperature change and oxygen utilized by the bee per unit time. So now we know how much energy the bee uses per unit time if it is flying or sitting still because, again, you're watching the bee in the lab. So now we have a lab study paired with a field study. How much energy does the bee expend from the lab? How much energy does the bee get from the field? Okay, you put those together, and bam, you can answer the question about how much energy a bee has to spare after flying around and visiting 78 flowers per hour or something like that. So that's your, um, your study there. And your sample size is a bunch of bees of the same species. Your field study site is likely one mountain area, or if you're 
prairie, I guess, prairie area, a few, a few fields, however many you need to get the right number of bees. Oops. There you go. What about larger scale? So birds, the bees, and the gigantic trees. This is a local study, actually. This, um, I can't remember her name, but she wanted to know how are nutrients distributed through an ecosystem, and specifically how are nutrients distributed on the epiphytes of of big leaf maple. So what this, um, this young lady did for her graduate study was, um, I think it was graduate study, anyway, she measured how much nitrogen was actually coming in to these uh, mosses and to these ferns, these licorice ferns and various types of mosses living on a big leaf maple, because here are trees that have just this huge branch, and then there is an ecosystem on that branch. So this is a large scale measurement of what type of nutrients exist in a whole forest ecosystem starting at about two meters above the ground. So we're not measuring the ground stuff, we're measuring all the epiphytes that are around. And you can actually look around and see all these, um, all these lichens, all these mosses, all these trees. It turns out a lot of the, um, ferns, sorry, on the trees, um, a lot of the input here actually comes from the leaves as they fall and land on the branches and are taken up by the roots of all of these epiphytes. So measurements of nutrient cycling were done here and your field study is this enormous Pacific Northwest forest and a whole bunch of trees on that, um, in that Northwest forest. All right, so this is where we're gonna get a bit of a break uh, da, da, da. Look at some techniques. And the next few slides, I'm going to skip through the next few slides. We're actually going to do this uh, via a video. The next few slides are for your, um, for your review. So let's head over to campus. Hey, so I'm on campus today to do the uh, random transect, a quadrat, and random sampling from a population method. So the idea here is we have this big field. This is uh, Moyer Meadows. The computer is currently on the uh, sacrifice rock. And this is Moyer Meadows. We want to know what is the weed population of Moyer Meadows like? Essentially, what proportion of Moyer, Moyer Meadows is covered in weeds? So we do know, roughly, the total area covered by a Moyer Meadows. So we want to take a random sample of that and then say, extrapolate from that random sample, what's the total population in the total area? And there's uh, two methods we're going to use to that, for that today. The first one is going to be a transect. We're going to take a line in a known direction and we can say what our encounter rate is with weeds over a known distance. So I'm encountering like five weeds per meter and that'll tell me how many weeds there are per unit length. So how do we do that? Well, we got this tape measure here. The, the rolling tape measures are being used elsewhere. I'm gonna have to anchor it. You got your uh, standard rock here. I'm gonna put this right underneath. It's, there we go. That's the start and I'm gonna walk away. It's not a long transcript, transect. To do is a 100-inch uh, transect. Okay, well, pull it short, and I've got one, two weeds. So I can say, if I were to just randomly walk around the meadows, I'm going to encounter one weed for every 50. I had to do it in inches, um, 50 inches. So one weed per 50 inches. That'll give me a rough understanding of what the encounter rate is for the meadow as a whole. Another method would be to take an area, probably the more useful method given this. And for that, we have a quadrat. This is a one square meter quadrat. And I'm going to take it out and I'm going to drop it somewhere. And you really want to get a random sampling. So one method would just be to throw it. Don't do that, these will break. I have broken them. Another method would just be to blindfold someone and have them walk around a random number. You can also choose a random number generator for how many steps north, how many steps east, or how many steps west or south based on negative and positive numbers. A whole bunch of different methods. I'm just going to walk around somewhere where the video can see me. Bias there.
We've got five weeds there. So five weeds in this quadrat. Knowing the area of the quadrat and knowing that I've encountered five weeds, then boom, I can calculate if I have the entire area. I can extrapolate from a certain number of these, each being a sample, how many weeds are in the to in Moyer Meadows total. Ideally, I'd take about 20 transects, good sample size, got an average number of weeds per each, and that will help me to extrapolate what is the average number of weeds per meter here in Moyer Meadows. Now, sometimes you want to sample a population, and it's not an area thing so much as a well-mixed population that is going to be moving around. And for that, we're going to use um, the mark recapture method. So I have here population of marbles. So I can randomly mix this and I can also mark marbles. So I'm going to randomly sample, um, go for 12 marbles in here. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12. Okay, I've got 12 marbles. So I have a known number and I'm going to mark each one of them with this. May not be very visible there, but there is a mark on each of those 12 marbles. So I'm going to drop them back in here and I'm going to randomly distribute them. I'm going to reach back in, I'm going to sample another 12. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Now I can't look in and sample the ones that I know have markings. This can be pretty biased. Nine. There you go. Ten. 11 and 12. There we go. Now I got one out of those 12 was marked. So what I can imply by that is that I marked one twelfth of the po total population, which would mean if I marked 12 of them and my 12 that have been marked represent one twelfth of the total population, there must be 12 times 12. So there must be 104. 44, 144. I want to tell you that there are not, there are 86. So you can see that there may be some inaccuracies given there. First off, the uh, this is not a black marker, it is a pink marker. I didn't know that when I picked it out, but my sons have fun changing marker caps. So perhaps I can't see the marks very well, perhaps they rubbed off. Perhaps the, uh, the animals that I marked the first time became more frightened of my hand the second time. Now that's not going to happen with marbles, but we can have some animals become trap shy or trap happy depending. So there are errors inherent in each one of these systems, but each one of these represents a random measurement of a given population based on the encounter rate of individuals in that population. And we're back. So that's how we do mark and recapture. Man, I just completely botched the number of marbles there. I guess I probably, I probably should have marked them with a black marker, and now I have one. Uh, these are for your review, so we're not going to spend time on them. And in class, doing the in person, I'm going to have the same of marbles. I'm going to remember to use a black marker. There we go. All right. So that would be starting now with D. Let's start with the long-term ecological research. This is where we're going to get a very large area. And we're going to measure things at a very long scale. So the oldest of these is Rothamsted Farm in England. What he did, and Lord Rothamsted, was he started adding fertilizer to some parts of his soil, but not to others. And those fertilizers that he added would be night soil, or bone meal, or night soil and bone meal, or night soil, bone meal, and ashes. And basically took all of these um, measurements of what could grow well, given all of these different um, treatments to his fields. And he grew some with beans, and he grew some with wheat, and he grew some with rye, and he grew some with barley. So all of these different studies were started in, I think, 1865. It's still going. And he's collected soil from each of these samples. And that's one long-term 
agricultural research. A long-term ecological research is going to be very much a similar thing, but seeing how, um, how things play out on a long scale. And one of these good examples is uh, in Vermont or New Hampshire, it's Hubbard Brook. They just remove the whole forest. So, and you see this forest kind of delineated here by these, um, by these different sides of a mountain where you get one stream comes out of that forest. So all the drainage from that forest gets funneled now through that single culvert. And that single culvert you can use to measure how much water is coming out of the forest. And you can sample that water to determine how much nitrogen, how much carbon, how much phosphorus is all coming out of the forest after this deforestation experiment. And similar nearby experiments have deforested but left the slash piles. So all of the branches, they just were left there. Deforested but replanted with something. And they take a long time to answer these questions because you're looking at what are the long-term effects of ecological research. And this is the kind of study site where you can ask a lot of questions based on a single treatment. So how does deforestation affect phosphorus outflow? How does deforestation affect new growth of invasive species? How does deforestation affect the invertebrate biodiversity? So all of these questions can be asked and then hypotheses made, predictions given. If we deforest the site, then the invertebrate diversity will increase because there are more new niches rising. I don't know. It's a prediction. It can be tested. And that can be done with a long-term ecological research. There are several sites throughout the United States where long-term ecological research takes place. I have a short-term ecological research project going on in my lab where we are measuring the uh, size of scotch broom seeds and the natural selection on scotch broom seed size over a half decade. So, well, that's my plan. I don't know. I mean, Maybe I'll keep it going afterwards. We'll see. But that's the idea of a long-term ecological research. How do things change on a longer ecological scale? Modeling is another thing that can be done. So this is where we look at the ecosystems and see how they change over a long time and then make predictions. So you've probably seen the hockey puck graph before or the hockey stick graph. It looks at the amount of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere and says, okay, so here's the amount of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere, what plants were present at the same time. So they can do these ice cores and see what the concentration of atmospheric carbon dioxide was. And they can do these pollen cores and they can see what trees were present based on what pollen was present at what time. And you can then take this and say, given this much carbon, what is the trees that are going to be, going to be present? So we see in the bottom of a lake in uh, North America, you'll see spruce, you'll see it get replaced by beech, you'll see it get replaced by its chestnut, yep, and then you see all the chestnut disappear all at once when the chestnut blight happens. So this is a historical record of what happened. And starting with spruce, you see it was very cold when the spruce were there. And you can see that by temperature measurements and um, using temperature measurements and carbon dioxide. Okay, so carbon dioxide concentrations were low, temperatures were low, there was spruce here. Carbon dioxide increased and then temperature increased and the spruce got replaced by beech, got replaced by chestnut, got replaced by a whole bunch of invasive species because humans messed everything up. So what's happening now though with carbon dioxide? Well, it's going higher and higher and higher. It has gone higher since I got this graph, of course. It's now over 400 uh, parts per million. And it's never really happened before. So what do we predict will happen? And that's the idea of modeling that we're going to make predictions based on historical trend. If every time the carbon dioxide went up, the temperature went up, then if we're entering unprecedented times in carbon dioxide concentrations, we're going to see the temperature go up too. The problem with this is some would say that if the relationship is reversed, that every time the temperature goes up, that the carbon dioxide goes up as well, which is interesting because the temperature has gone up recently, and the carbon dioxide has gone up recently, but the temperature hasn't gone up as much as the carbon dioxide has gone up. So you've really got a question that you could ask, and that's where modeling may take place. And there are some questions that could be answered via modeling. So this is another one of these ecological techniques that we can use. 
So how do we use these? Well, we can use uh, these to predict things like forestry yields. So how much wood product can we get out of a given amount of forest? How often can we harvest trees? What do we do with all the extra slash? How do we prevent the spread of invasive species? And these are answerable utilizing different ecological te te techniques and coming from different ecological perspectives. How often do we harvest trees? Well, that is a population biology question. So how fast do they grow? How fast do they reproduce? How much mass do they gain per year? Um, what should we do with all the extra slash? Okay, so um, basically with the tree, you've got the, uh, the bore, and that's going to be your just your trunk. And for a dug fir, it's just this really straight thing. And, um, or a tulip tree would be another good example, very straight trunk. Then all these branches, they can be cut off um, and just left on site because their value is relatively low, or you can ship them off and make, and make mulch out of them. You can also do that with wood chips, and there's plenty of bark here, so, you know, just leave them on site. Do you leave them in piles and burn them? Or do you put them all over the forest floor? And that's the ecophysiology questions, because if you leave them all over the forest floor, what happens is you're actually, uh, you're dumping them on top of where you might put future trees. So are these future trees going to benefit from a more humid, slightly shaded environment, or are they going to benefit from a le more dry, um, less shaded, more sunny environment? So that's an eco ecophysiology question you can ask about young Douglas fir development and how slash piles or slash fields are going to impact that. Then how do we prevent invasive species? So one thing I love about the Pacific Northwest forestry um, companies is that they leave the things that are not harvested. They don't feel the need to harvest and then burn everything. Now they, they leave all the other trees. And if you go to one of the field sites after they've done all this cutting, they leave a lot of branches just lying everywhere. And then they also leave all of the um, big, all of the, not big leaf maple, but vine maples. They leave all of the yew trees, they leave the um, spirea or whatever else exists, the dogwoods and such, the native blackberries. And by leaving all of these, you create a community that is using more niches and that may help in preventing the spread of invasive species. These are all forestry questions and these are all ecology questions. And every one of these ecological questions brings answers in terms of yield. So there is very, very practical issues that come out of asking ecological questions and using ecological techniques to measure them. So let's say that there is a, an optimal time to harvest a tree. So our prediction would be that if we measure a tree over time, then there will be allocation to wood that will kind of level out after about 50 years. So your sample size needs to be sufficient to get more varieties, a couple of harvests, different field sites, this is setting up an ecological question. Your technique would be measuring how old they are, measuring how much wood they have taken, and uh, I guess um, diameter and breast height. And you answer this, and then you change conditions, perhaps. So there's an optimal time to harvest a tree. Okay, they seem to be best after 60 years. Or would they grow faster if we've left all these branches on the ground? Or would they grow faster if we fertilize the... That's expensive. We're not doing that. But there are a lot of different questions you could be asking and a lot of different ecological techniques you could be using to get a very practical answer in terms of cash. All right, last. This is kind of a, um, a question we've been using lately, and that's will thinning and slash piles help riparian zones? So a riparian zone is not a forestry issue. And if you go to the capital forest, you're going to see different treatments on riparian zones. This isn't a forestry issue, this is a fisheries issue, because your streams are going to have um, a certain amount of water in them. Duh, that means make it with stream. Okay, then are they going to have the same amount of water in the summer? Well, no, because it dries out, there's less rainfall. Okay, what slows down the, dry, the drying? Well, what slows down the drying is how much evaporation occurs. So, do we thin the trees closer to the riparian zone and leave slash piles? Or do we have to have a larger buffer around riparian zones? What is going to make the flow in the streams stay the longest? And this does matter because you also you want to actually keep it relatively cool. 
So if you keep it relatively cool, keep the stream area relatively cool, then that's going to mean cool water downstream. If you have cool water downstream, you've got salmon. And if you've got salmon downstream, then, then, then you have fisheries that can utilize these salmon. Cutting, just slashing all the trees and leaving a dry desiccated area means any water that will leave, if any leaves, will be a low water level and very hot water. And low water levels with hot water kill salmon. So this is the interaction and the interface between, say, Weyerhaeuser and um, well, maybe even the shellfish industry, Taylor Shellfish, because they're getting the outflow of these streams as well. So major local industries have to answer these ecological questions. Do we um, have commercial thinning where we actually take some of these trees out and replenish the trees and leave these, uh, these dead piles of slash in the ground? Or do we just leave the trees as it is? If you go to the Capitol Forest, you'll see that they have changed their techniques in the past couple of decades. You can see these older stream zones where they actually have, um, what is it, big leaf maple and alder trees next to the stream because they cut everything down to the stream. And then the things that grew back were non-harvestable trees. Big leaf maple and alder wood isn't worth much. Or they've left some of these Douglas fir trees next to the streams and they've thinned them down and just left the slash piles and kept the trees in place. And those trees in place are going to, well, they'll be the same species and you can harvest one or two later on when, after you've replaced and replenished them. So I want you as groups in class, obviously, or on your own just kind of for fun to come with a hypothesis and a prediction, what's your sample size? How would you measure things? You don't actually have a budget. You don't actually have undergrads working for you. So you can make hypothetical ones and have a budget of millions of dollars. It's great, you know, go wild, go wild, have some fun thinking about how you would test predictions and how you would make hypotheses. So put this in the September 2nd comments section of the forum that has been made. What's your hypothesis? What's your prediction? What do you see going on? And that's, uh, that's how we're going to take attendance for this class. So yeah, there's some ecological techniques for you. You've got transects, quadrats, mark recaptures in the little video, uh, long-term ecological research and modeling. So, and how these techniques are utilized in a very practical manner by businesses to answer ecological questions with real life impacts on their bottom line. Thank you.